Good morning, everybody. Wow, that's loud. I don't usually need a lot of amplification. <laughs> Welcome to worship this morning. We might just get straight into it with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. It is a privilege. Thank you that we can come together um, as your church family here in Gatton Baptists and, and celebrate just how brilliant and wonderful you are and how kind you've been to us. We commit this service to you, Heavenly Father, and pray that it will honour you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing a couple of songs. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I see it now. I'm laying it down And I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father
Um, so announcements this morning. Um, again, most people mo- know Pat and know that Pat went home to be with Jesus, and I believe that was one of the last words was it's time for me to go home to be with Jesus. So that was lovely. Um, funeral, I think, is um, not this Tuesday, the following Tuesday at this stage, but more details will come out later on time, etc. Um, any other announcements? Are there any children in the resending out? There is. They're already gone. Good. Okay. Cool. None here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what else have we got? Nothing else on the announcements. Um, so I guess we'll have our time of uh, offering. I'll leave a few to look after that. Thanks, mate. Keep the music going, guys. Sorry. Um, we'll come into our prayer time now. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for thank you for the offering. Thank you for all the funds that go to help run a church and ultimately build your kingdom, because that's what it's about. Um, we thank you that we live in such a prosperous, um, healthy, safe environment. We are so blessed just to be Australian. There's many needs at the moment, even though we live where we live. um, There's many needs overseas. There's many needs within our community. So I invite you to to lift up your prayers. Please pray as you feel led, and I'll uh, close afterwards.
Heavenly Father, the world is in a terrible mess, but I guess we sort of knew that was coming. And I just thank you every day that you've saved us. Saved us from ourselves. Saved us from each other. May you be glorified always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing two more songs. blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Three. 
have so many opportunities to worship and praise you. And Lord, we'll just give you thanks today for your son, Jesus. Lord, who died for us on the cross and rose again, that we may have eternal life. That Father, through your spirit that abides in us, that lives in us, Lord, that we may be able to, Lord, live the faith that you've called us to. Lord, we'll just thank you and give you so much to praise you. In your name, amen. Please have a seat, folks. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Great to see smiling faces. Thank you for praying for us, and we appreciate prayer while we're away on leave for this little while. Just want to have a quick chat about prayer and prayer commitment in the church. I talked about this last week, and before the fellowship lunch was over, I already had prayer points in the box. So this is our prayer box. This is going in our prayer room, we, and we're going to have the upper prayer room, we're going to call it, but it's downstairs, because that's how we do things in Gatton. And so it's just on the way in. And this is the challenge for you. There's a several sheets of paper. So when you come into the prayer room, you write your prayers that you've been praying about on there, what God has laid in your heart to pray about. Don't write prayer requests. Write what God has called you to pray about and pop it in the box. The reason we're doing this is to give us an understanding of what God is doing in the life of the church. On Thursday, Donna and I went to the QB conference and uh, Carl Faye spoke there and he's got a new series of, and a book out called Faith Runs Deep. Talking about the legacy of Christianity through the, our nation from the very first fleet, the very first convicts all the way through. People in our history who have been faithful. We're not the lucky country, we're the blessed country. We keep saying that sometimes over and over again. And he shared a scripture verse, and I'm sitting there and I thought, I've heard this verse so many times before, and I thought, this is the verse for Sunday. And this is what it says, it's from Romans 1, and it's Romans 1, 16. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first. We're in a time when you understand the church is under attack. And if you look around, even our churches, our numbers of attendance, are starting to drop, not because we want big heaps of numbers, because we're looking for faith communities. And the world. And we need to shine to the world. If we're ashamed of the gospel, we can't step out in faith, then we've got other things we've got to be accountable for before God. We can't think of our own comfort. And you see, living the Christian life comes at a cost. It comes at a personal cost. It says that in Scripture. And so the cost I'm going to ask for you is this, to... Write down on the sheet on the wall, Donna's done a sheet up, a timetable. Commit yourself to come and pray the same time every week. So if it's 4.30am, you come at 4.30am. And you spend half an hour, it's all asking, 30 minutes, that's all the cost, but you, on your way to work, on your way home from work, in the middle of the night, you commit to that and write your name down in that slot or circle that slot. Sometimes you can do it two times a week if you want, three times a week. And Donna and I were talking before, she said, what if there's more than one person in the room praying at a time? I thought, oh, praise God. <laughs> um, just come and pray. You don't, if you pray out loud, that's fine. If your person needs to articulate or uh, verbalise your prayer. But we just encourage you to, to really bury into prayer, the upper prayer room. It'll be the lifeblood of our church and the way that we grow and see God work in the kingdom of God through G Gatton Baptist. I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be great. So if you haven't got a key, you want to get in sometime, Donna will find you a key. We don't have to worry about security. We don't have security in the church per se, like buttons we have to push. All you have to do is open the doors, pull them apart, come inside, they'll close behind you and you'll never get out again. Go and pray and then you can open up and lock yourself, lock it as you go out. But it's encouraging to do that. The second thing of prayer is that we're starting up our weekly prayer Fortnightly prayer. See, Joe's going, no, no, fortnightly. Though. If we've got such a huge amount of people coming to the upper prayer room, it's going to be so awesome. But also for the fortnightly prayer rooms now on a Wednesday night at 6.30. If we decide first and third or second, so it's the first and third Wednesday of each month, 6.30. And um, I'm looking forward and excited to when I come back from leave and opening up this box. And there's already people praying in here. There's already prayer notes in here. Well, it's pretty awesome right, full of prayer and get us a, and help us to, as a church to say, well, this is what the heart of God is saying. When we read through these prayer, prayer notes here, we'll say, oh, this is what God is doing. This is how God's moving the people of our church. 
but ask God to allow in your heart what his prayer is so you can speak his prayer. Let me read that passage again. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For everyone who believes and trusts at first to the Jew then to the Gentile. And then it says in verse 17, For in the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I pray that in this next fortnight that God's going to do great stuff in the life of the church. Looking forward to it, Steve, when we come back. Thank you. Please stand and we'll sing our next song. I love the words of this song. They're very humbling. you speak a hundred billion galaxies are formed in the vapor of your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see As 
Please be seated. Uh, it's uh, uh, I just find that such an awesome song. And I don't know if you've seen the pictures. Um, I think it's the Webb Telescope. Is that right? Just incredible, the detail of the stars. They take a little pinpoint of that sky, and it's full. Hundred billion galaxies, or however many there are, so big and so vast, and yet this God who created such vastness cares for you, cares for me. <laughs> and this God desires intimacy with him companionship with him nearness with him and and that's uh, today's message near to jesus i um uh, felt led by god to the last chapter of john's gospel john chapter 21 and we'll be going uh, through john 21 uh, the next three weeks and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 14 this morning. So we're going to read through it. And if I can get this thing to... Have I got to switch it on? Yes, I do. Ah, here we go. So uh, th this, is, this is my preferred version for one of whatever version. But uh, So I'll put it on the screen so you can follow along there if you like. Uh, John 21, 1 to 14. So let's read the passage through first, get familiar with what we're looking at this morning. It says there, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, Tiberias, that's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. So there's seven of them. Simon said to them, I'm going fishing. Hmm. Seems like a great idea. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. Nothing. But when the day was now breaking... Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did know, not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. 
And he said to them, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat and you will find the catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, he said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard, oh, I haven't been clicking through. Yeah, sorry. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Hmm. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away. That's about 90 metres, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it. And bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish, fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So we're going to go through this passage. And we're going to look at what it means to come near to Jesus. Have you ever been away from home for an extended period of time? Maybe overseas or interstate. Perhaps on a work away from home trip or an extended holiday. Maybe even study. You know, when you've been away from home for a long time, it's Easy to feel homesick, isn't it? Especially if things aren't going so well. So when the time comes, you begin to make the trek back home. And as you get closer and closer, you start to see the familiar things. You look forward to coming around each bend. There's a rising joy. There's an anticipation as that longing and sense of belonging starts to increase and move through your being. And then, when you finally arrive, you unpack your baggage, you sit on your favourite chair, put your feet up with your preferred beverage, take in a deep breath, relax, you're home. You're home. There's that place when you get closer and closer that sits well with your soul and brings comfort through your being. A place you can truly call home. You know, for the follower of Christ, that place of peace and comfort, that place of joy and rest, it is in Jesus and in nearness to him come home Jesus says come home to me he's the place we can call home the gospel of John calls it abiding it's the place of your abode where you dwell where your heart is because he is in your heart he is the place we can call home. It's in a person, the Son of God. It's nearness to Jesus that I want us to consider this morning from this passage. 
and as disciples of Jesus. I want us to consider what being distant from Christ looks like and discover the benefits of being near and intimate with God through Christ. We will encounter Christ in the process of drawing near to him. <clears throat> but we start with the dark nothing. In the passage we're looking at this morning, we meet up with seven disciples of Jesus. In the days, in the weeks, following Jesus' resurrection, but before he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now just consider what the disciples are going through. They're in this kind of no man's land, a limbo, in the quandary of what to do next. They're disciples of Jesus and they've spent the last three years by Jesus' side. They ate with him, walked with him, listened to him, and counted his teachings, saw his miracles, sat with him, followed him, camped with him, watched him. They'd been constantly by his side. Now he had died. And not only died, he rose again from the dead. Hallelujah. And now that he had risen from the dead, he would only appear with them for just a period, short period of time. And then he'd disappear again. They'd physically seen him twice since he walked out of the grave. Once on the day he was resurrected, or that night, and then again eight days later. Now they were gathered together in Galilee and really don't know what to do. So Peter decides, I'm going fishing. And it's here, in this kind of place, that God has so many things he wants to teach us as we find ourselves in that same familiar place as the disciples were with Jesus. So let's just look at verses 1 to 3. After these things, Jesus manifested, that is, he revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, or Sea of Galilee, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, he's a local, and the sons of Zebedee, also local fishermen, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we will also come with you. They went out, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Hmm. So notice these things. At a loss for what to do, Peter decides to go fishing. He was a fisherman. He grew up as a fisherman. And the rest want to go along. Now among them are these professional fishermen. Those who grew up and lived in the region. They're no slouches, knowing the best fishing spots and the best times to fish. I dare say, and this is my uh, <laughs> thinking through, but I dare say they knew the phases of the moon, the seasons, the wind directions for best results. I mean, they're fishermen, professionals. Uh, they were doing this for a living. And they're generational as well. So it's night. It's dark. And they go through the night and catch zip. Nothing. Nada. Now, God's not against fishing. But there is something to learn here. These are disciples of Jesus. But where is Jesus in this part of the picture? Where is he? He's simply not there. And he hasn't even been approached. You know, things work so much better with Jesus, even when fishing. Even when fishing. 
You know, as disciples of Jesus, we sometimes come up with our own plans and our own methods of what we think would work for Christ's kingdom. We come up with our own plan of action and make do with our own desires and our own approaches. May, they may even be intellectually designed. But where is Jesus? Where is he? What we can find as servants of Christ who row out on our own course of action is that Jesus is not in the boat. It's dark without him and we achieve nothing. You know, there are countless stories of believers who've been wonderfully saved and so filled with love and joy for Jesus that they just want to do all they can for him. And so come up with all these plans and all their own course of action, but leave him behind. Don't even wait for him, nor include him in what is being done. And it might have all the best intentions and the best desires in the world. All these things are done in the hope of trying to make him proud of us or aiming to have him pleased in our works, seeking to please him. So off we go. And it's not long before we're spent, we're burnt out and we're disillusioned. There's the testimony of so many, even mine. We find that all our own efforts, when tallied up, have met for nothing eternally and profited nothing for nearness of relationship in him. Now, it's at this point that we are in desperate need to rediscover Jesus and closeness to him. Jesus is the light. And being distant from him is cold and dark. Jesus tells us to abide, be at home in him. And what did Jesus say? Apart from him, we can do nothing. We need him. Desperately need him. And we need to be drawn into that nearness and closeness of relationship with him. The disciples tarried all night in the dark and caught nothing. Nothing but frustration. And we will achieve the same eternal results when going on in our own gusto. Point number two. Is it or isn't it Jesus? You know, there's a pathway to nearness of fellowship in Jesus. And we find that he's already there waiting. He's never really that far from each one of us, waiting and calling for us to come. But there are some hazards within each one of us. There are hurdles that need to be overcome. Let's look at verses 4 to 6. But when the day was now breaking, (laughs) we'd been through the night, now the sun is starting to peek out or the the first twilight is coming. Twilight? Breaking light. Jesus stood on the beach. And yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, (laughs) addresses them as children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, very specific, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. You know, Jesus is now in the picture as the light of day is breaking. Now, that light of day break there's that mixture of light and darkness isn't there 
at that daybreak time. And just so, they are in the boat and Jesus is on the shore. There is still this distance between them and they don't know if it's him or not. They fail to recognise him. Their spiritual eyes have not yet fully opened. Our journey back into nearness and harmony with Christ may take the same twist. We can get so used to following our own plans and designs that we grow deaf to recognising the voice of our shepherd. We fail to make out the shape of his form. Notice that Jesus is waiting on the shore, waiting for that right moment to introduce himself back into their lives. God and his son has this way of letting us run after our own affairs just so that we will come to know our desperate need of him. Just like what happened in the parable of the prodigal son. The father gave him the inheritance and let him go because he needed to be on that journey to rediscover who God, his father, is. You know, he'll let us toil through the darkness of night in our own affliction before shining the light of his presence. There's this point we must come to to realise the futility of life without our Lord. Jesus makes a statement in his question to the the disciples when he asks, when he says, children, you do not have any fish, do you? Jesus knew. He knew they'd caught nothing. I think Jesus expected it at this point in time. And I would expect that God kept these experienced fishermen from catching anything to bring them a very important principle, which is why John has recorded this in his gospel. Now God, as I said before, is not against even such a simple thing as fishing. I mean, Jesus goes on to say, cast the net on the other side. But it works so much better when he's included in all that we do. Even the menial, simple things of life. Include him in everything. Jesus tells them to cast the net on the right side of the boat in order for them to realise in this moment a miraculous catch. But before this moment, They are not yet experiencing the intimacy of nearness to Jesus and so they fail to recognise him. They hear his voice but don't know if it's him. Is that where your life in Christ is at? He's speaking to you but you're not sure if it's him or not. You know, it's a sign of distance from Jesus. Intimacy with Christ does not question if he's there or not. It knows. There are a number of times when Jesus appeared to his followers after his resurrection and they did not physically recognise him. Mary Magdalene was the first. Didn't recognise Jesus until she heard him call her name. Mary. Here the disciples do not recognise him until he does some miraculous event that reminds them of him. The two on the road to Emmaus failed to recognise him until the breaking of bread. And from there they recounted how their hearts burned as Jesus had unveiled the Old Testament to them. You know, it's not the physical recognition of Jesus that God is looking for but spiritual recognition of who Jesus is. That spiritual connection with him. It's knowing Jesus that brings us into intimacy with him. Knowing him. Not intellectually. Connected spiritually. 
having spiritual ears open to hear his voice, spiritual eyes open to see his truth, spiritual hearts renewed with the inhale of his breath. When the time is right, Jesus will call out to us and he will do what no one else can do. He will bring divine impact to help us recognise him because he does what no other can. But we need to be ready for him. And it requires giving up on our own self-reliance. That's actually the sin nature that all of us struggle with. You know, the disciples may have not have recognised him and even though they toiled through the night catching nothing, They'd given up on their own self-plight and followed the direction of this stranger on the shore. And Jesus was revealing himself to them. You know, it's God's heart to continually draw us to himself and we need to learn to wait on him. That's the problem with sausage fingers. <laughs> the buttons are way too close. I need a, something. <laughs> oh dear. Well, coming closer. Coming closer. Now, John was the first to recognise Jesus. And it came as they began to draw in this miraculous hall. Let's look at it. Verses 5 to 8. We're going. Thank you. <laughs> Sausage thumb. Okay. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. He's recognised Christ through what is happening. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on because he'd been stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, (laughs) just a little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. Now we'll talk more about Peter and what's going on here next week. But John recognised Jesus in this moment. And it's very reminiscent of the time when Jesus first called these fishermen to follow him. Yeah, three years ago, they'd spent all night doing the same thing, toiling hard, and like now, they caught nothing. The next morning, those three years ago, they were washing their nets, and Jesus comes and asks to sit in the boat to teach the people that had gathered on the shore. He chose Simon Peter's boat. And when he was finished, he told Peter to lower the nets. And of course, Peter says, Lord, we've been at this all night. <laughs> anyway, as you wish. That time the nets were breaking for the quantity of fish, but not this time. With the resurrection of Jesus comes resounding strength. Old nets may break, but new nets hold. There's a story and a message in there, but we'll look at that more next week. We must let go of the old ways and live full in the new. When the disciples begin to recognise Jesus, they come to the shore. They come closer. They draw near. When Jesus makes himself known to us, which direction are we going? Intimacy and peace are found in nearness to Christ, coming to him. We may be fearful, we may be ashamed, we might even feel unworthy or believe we're unlovable. But Jesus' heart is for fellowship, making new, 
drawing near, letting go of the past and walking forward with him. Jesus is ever ready for us to come to him. James, thank you, I'll let you go then. (laughs) James tells us this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Is Jesus speaking into your life this morning? Are you desiring intimacy or fellowship with him? Don't run from him. Don't hide or shy away. Come. He simply says, come. Number four. Intimacy at last. Uh, The background picture, I don't know. How do you have a picture of intimacy with God? had trouble finding something in it but there's this connection with him that's spiritual and real and deep and personal you know we may have set our own course and run our own race but when we realize the nothingness the emptiness and the futility of striving for God without him that is the time We'll find Jesus on the shore, ready to make himself known to us. Draw near to him as he draws near to you. Get out of your own boat and come and find what he has provided for you. Look at these next verses. So when they got out on the land, that's where Jesus was, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Here is this intimacy, a relationship with Christ. The guessing disappears. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested or revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus is ready and waiting. Come, sit at his campfire, eat food you have not worked for, spiritual food that satisfies the deep longings of the soul. Break bread with Jesus and receive from him. Bring what he has miraculously provided. Sit with Jesus. Eat with Jesus. Know his grace. Beautiful grace. Flowing grace. The spirit of God coming in to your life. Smell the aroma of freshly baked bread. Taste the succulent morsels of fresh fish. I can tell you there's nothing better than eating a freshly caught fish the morning you you catch it. (laughs) Rest from all your wearisome labours and receive what he has prepared. Fellowship in the light and warmth of his fire. Come, camp with Jesus. Camp there with him. This is nearness with God and it is good. You know, we make this life so complicated, so twisted, so hard. Whilst there there are troubles in this world, the trouble is within ourselves. Fellowship with Jesus is rich and sweet and full. Don't complicate the two. 
Don't misinterpret the two. If it's not peace, it's not Christ. It's the enemy who brings confusion. Life's too short to miss out on the real deal. All Jesus has ever asked of us is to trust him. It's as simple as that. Believe in him and simply be with him in all of what he is doing. There is enough difficulty in this world, but our relationship with God ought not to be so difficult. What complicates it? What confuses it? Isn't it that nature within ourselves? We want to blame everyone else and everything else, but it comes down between me and God, you and God. It's this nearness of God that provides for spiritual peace. A spiritual peace that restores the soul into right submissive relationship to God's spirit. Through all the toil of self-effort in darkness, let's realise our need of God. Let him reveal himself and be be prepared to surrender what has not been given over to him. You might be surprised what's in your life that does not come from him. Surprised at what he will show you. Things we have held on to as vital and necessary, uh, necessary. But he says, let it go. All of us struggle with things we grew up with as children, thinking that was God. And it's not. They might have the appearance of being something genuine and real. But it doesn't draw us closer to him. It separates us. Let the dawn of his presence break over your heart and mind and draw closer to him. Enjoy his presence. Enjoy it. Receive everything he offers. Don't hold back. He's there to give it because he wants you to receive it. It's all about relationship with him. Sit and rest in his provision. What he has provided. You don't have to work for it. Be filled with grace upon grace. Exceeding grace, abundant grace. This is his life. Intimacy with God is surrendering to Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through him. Know him. No second guessing. No uncertainty. Nearness in Jesus is total and full assurance. Because we won't find it in ourselves. We find it only in him who has completed the race and who has done it all. And in him we find peace and rest. Don't rob yourself of all he is ready and waiting to give. When we focus on ourselves, we might focus on our own unworthiness. Or we may do the total opposite by relying on our own pride. Either way, Jesus is not near. We find him when we are found in him. And it's all Jesus. All. I'd like to finish by reading uh, from Psalm 73. Uh, This is in in, uh, the version that I tend to read. Psalm 73, 25 to 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength. Literally, God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. Let me say something there. There is that part in us that is unfaithful to God, isn't there? That sin nature that 
drives us from him. He has destroyed it. He did it in Christ at Calvary. That old man has been crucified with Christ. We talk about the world out there as the evil ones. We've got the world in us. It's only Christ who saves. Sinners saved by grace. The psalmist says this, But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. The nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. When you're drowning at sea, you grab what will keep you afloat because you will drown. God is our refuge, our life raft, our hope. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works, God. The message version it puts it this way. You're all I want in heaven. You're all I want on earth. When my skin sags, who's getting older? Who's sagging? The wrinkles come. The bones get brittle. I don't know, I've been reflecting this week. What I used to do as a young fella, playing volleyball, if the ball was without reach, I'd die. Nowadays... Mm. (laughs) things aren't going to come back standing in upright position, I know it. Or it's going to take me months to recover. God is rock firm and faithful. Look, those who left you are falling apart. Deserters, they'll never be heard from again. But I am in the very presence of God. Do you know that? Know it. Not second-guessing where it's all him. Oh, how refreshing it is. I've made, Lord God, my home. There's home. What did Pat say? I've gone to be home with God. God, I'm telling the world what you do. You know, intimacy with Jesus, it's not about making ourselves busier. Making ourselves busier only keeps us from, from, what's, from seeing what we've lost. Intimacy with Jesus is simply about being. Being with him. Being filled by him being close to him in all that he does and wherever he leads, being open to him, being available for whatever or whoever he brings across life's path to share what being in him is all about. I think that is the simple gospel message. Intimacy with God eternal hope, eternal life and knowing him. That is nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's everything to bring to others. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, Lord, you know our hearts. You know our lives. Lord, you know our frustrations, our futilities. Lord, you know when there's nothing in the net. You know when we're empty. Lord, when in all our struggles, it's achieved nothing. But Father, thank you for your son. Lord, we're in our own boat so often. And yet Jesus is standing on the shore in the light of a new day. Lord, that we would find ourselves at his campfire, 
camped with Jesus, with him wherever he goes. Lord, thank you that as he rose and ascended on high, Lord, he sent your spirit, your spirit that so filled and, and ruled in his life. Lord, come to fill and rule in our lives. Lord, that where he is, we will also be because we're connected. Lord, to know nearness of intimacy and relationship with you, what else is there, Lord, but you, our God, to know you, to live you, and to declare you to others, that others might come, Lord, to know you. But, Lord, you speak through us. Lord, you make yourself known by your voice and by your spirit's call. Lord, we don't need people drawn to us. Lord, you must draw them to yourself because that's where we have found life. So thank you for these things in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. Um, we're going to stand and sing the last song. Um, hmm. Is it goodness of God? Goodness of God. Let's, let's stand and sing, shall we? Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Can we say with the psalmist, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. 